Not too much, but I talked to Ms. Dossier about it. All right. Well, anyway, I didn't know it was going to be on, and I just happened to run on to it. But um, she had uh, had interviewed uh, educators and teachers and whatnot in New York City and New York, um, in California and several other states, and they were sort of saying, what's the matter with our schools today? Uh, why is it that some children go out of school, go out of high school, and they can't read? And so she was discussing with other schools. They were telling how the teachers conducted their rooms and, and all. And when Barbara summed it up, two thoughts stood in my mind that she said. One was that children are not taught and led to do enough thinking, creative thinking, and that they were not given enough problem solving. Because, you know, solving those problems um, makes you think. I noticed this, this week, though, that you must have had some problem solving. Lauren and Brett had a sheet or two home where uh, they were having problem solving. They didn't say that that was all the teacher's responsibility to teach you that. I wonder who's el who else has a part in that. Your parents. You know, you can sit at the table or you can sit at home in front of the television. Your folks can discuss and explain to you some of the things that you don't understand. Um, I think you were asked to watch what some of the problem was here a while back over in China. All of those things that you see and that your parents can help with you will also make you a creative thinker. And also will help you solve problems and so forth. Now, before I quit talking, um, I'm going to ask you to get a pencil and paper and lay it on your desk. represents the year that I was born. So you want to write born after that. Now I want you to write 1926 off someplace else for the side of it. That's the year that I started teaching in a one-room school. Okay. I had gone to college one year and one summer when I taught my first year of school. I can see that school, one-room school, and we call them rural schools back in Missouri. Uh, it was a building that was not as big as this building, this room. I expect if it was about the size, if you would stop right at the end of that cabinet or closet, I can't see very well, whatever it is, that white cabinet back there, if you just cut that off from there up here, it was about that big. Now, we didn't have any electric lights. 
at all. We didn't have any water fountains in the house to drink out of. We didn't have any bathroom in the house to go to. We, the girls went to a little outhouse in one corner of the playground, and the boys had one down in the other corner. But you didn't have very many people in the wintertime asking to leave the room. <laughs> but we had a morning recess of 15 minutes, an afternoon for that, and also the noon hour of an hour. We started school at 9 o'clock in the morning, but we didn't get out until 4. Now I suspect the reason for starting at 9 was because uh, boys and girls had to walk to school. There were no buses. Par very few parents had any had a car in our neighborhood. Um, the roads were all dirt roads, and once in a while, a student lived a little too far away from home to walk would come on a horse, tie the horse up, and stand there during the cold weather outside tied to a post. But. Um, Usually, the children walked to school. They walked through the fields, and sometimes they had to walk along the muddy roads. They wore, they didn't call them boots, they called them galoshes. They had two or three buckles on them. They wore, put them on over your shoe. Sometimes they'd come to school pretty muddy looking, and they'd um, always kept a paper down up in front of the building, off over to the side where they put their boots on uh, of, after they'd take them off of a morning. I wouldn't make them leave them outside because if it was winter time, why, it'd be too cold for them to put them on their feet. Now, boys and girls just dressed very plain. Boys always wore blue jeans some colored shirt, but they